Hey, Bridget, go ahead. Um, I, I was just wondering um, if we don't have enough firms in like a regional, when we're doing the pricing in like a regional, uh, like com go, comparable screen, expand, should we go? Expand the, expand the region. Okay, but not straight to global, maybe like to emerging markets yeah, or something. Could, for instance, let's say, what, what country are you looking at? I'm um, India. Okay, you can go Asia first, emerging markets, okay. so basically you can kind of Got expand it. out. Got it, thanks. Okay, folks, it's time as people join in, a, a couple of quick reminders. One is we're almost at the end, a week away from our last class. Here's what's left. We have class today, obviously, we're going to talk about acquisitions. We have class on Wednesday, we're going to talk about changing value in a firm. In other words, we're going to, can, I call this a class that connects corporate finance to valuation. How do investment decisions, financing decisions, dividend decisions play out in value? And next Monday is going to be called, you know, like a grind climactic class where everything in the class comes together. But I'll need your help for it to happen. And here's what, uh, what I will need from you. Now, as you work on your project and as you get the numbers for your company, I would like you to go to that Google shared spreadsheet. I've harassed you multiple times about this and enter the numbers for your company. It's not, I'm not asking for much. I'm asking for six numbers, right? Basically six inputs, basically what, uh, you know, in the discounted cash flow model, you know, what did, you know, what discounted cash flow model did you use? What gives you DCF value and on pricing? What multiple did you use? What is your pricing? And then if you had an option, if you had an option component in your company to one in 10 companies might be what option value. And then I ask you to do buy, sell or hold. And I, the reason I need that is next Monday when I come to class, I'm going to bring your own results back to you. In other words, 200 people in the class. This is how many said buy. This is how many said sell. This is how many found undervalued. And, there, and I'm going to contrast what you find with what you know, people found last semester, which was at the height of COVID, the semester before that. The sem in fact, I'll take you all the way back to 1999. And you can see how the class pickings have changed over time. So you can get a sense of perspective. What is, what's changed and how does it work? Now, how does it relate to what happened in the market in subsequent periods? So that's uh, next, so that'll be for next Monday's class. Your actual project is not due till 5 p.m. on Monday, which is, the, which is the 10th last day of class. But the numbers obviously have to come to me by Sunday night so that I can feed them into your presentation for Monday. On Wednesday, of course, you have a final exam. It's going to be cumulative, so it'll cover everything in the class next Monday, not this Monday, but next Monday, it's the 12th. It'll cover everything in the class, which is kind of daunting because a class is three packets, almost 700 pages of notes. But in a sense, you've already had multiple times with DCF. So it looks more like it's more than it is. It'll be cumulative. It'll be a two hour final and it'll be accessible for about, I might even make it 16 hours that day because with two hours, you need to have more time to be able to take it. So you have the luxury of deciding whether to take it in the morning when you're fresh or in the evening because you have other, other exams coming through. So it'll, there'll be enough flexibility built in that you should be able to take it. Are there any questions though before uh, I get started? Jacob? Yeah, so if the exam will be two hours, I guess uh, it's reasonable to assume it'll be twice as long. So about 10 questions. About twice as long, yeah. It'll be, so you had five questions, I think, on the quizzes. You'll have 10 on the final. And each will be worth 3%. three so it's a 30% final. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Nick? Yeah, my question is, Professor, do you have a, like a sample final? For us to go over. Check, check check your email from was it yesterday? Ah, okay. Yeah. I'll, okay, so it should right. be it should be there. Yeah, the link should be there. Okay. It's also in the web page for the, the the webcast page for the class as the final exam. It has a review session, final exams, solutions. So everything should be there. Okay, so let's talk about acquisitions today. There won't be any start of the class test because I'm going to test you as we go through class today because in each stage, I'm going to make you part of my experiment. Because today I'm going to talk about what I call the seven deadly sins in acquisitions. I'm going to list them out at the start and it's going to sound abstract, but we're going to hit every one of them. The first is what I call risk transference, where an acquiring company thinks it can magically endow a target company with whatever its risk profile is. 
we talk about debt subsidies, acquiring companies access to cheap debt and a lot of debt, should you build that into the target company's valuation? Then we're gonna visit the word control. Remember we, in the start of the class, I gave you a three by five card with the word control. And I talked about how bankers attach a 20% premium to control. I want to revisit that question. I call it autopilot control and how to do it right. Then we're gonna take that magic word that shows up in every acquisition, synergy and drill in on how you value synergy and how much of that value you pay for. Then we're gonna talk about pricing in the context of acquisitions. Remember we talked about pricing in this class where you look at comparable companies and multiple people do that in acquisitions, but in a very skewed way. We'll talk about what skews pricing in acquisitions. And then we're gonna introduce how bias plays out here, especially when top management has already made the decision on doing the acquisition and your job as a low person in the totem pole is to justify that decision. And finally, we're gonna bring in accountability, which is in my view, a lot of bad deals happen, but nobody's held responsible for them. Not the bankers, not the managers, not the acquiring company. And as long as that continues, bad deals will continue to happen. Right? So I need some help along the way as we go through. So let's start with this. And as we go through, I'd like you to keep this table and you can be honest with yourself. You don't have to show me the results. I'm going to take you through a series of seven tests. And I want you to specify whether you pass the test. And if you fail it, what's your explanation for why you picked the answer that you did and how you might reconcile it with what we've learned in the class. Right? So keep this aside and you can go through at each stage and ask yourself, did I pass that level? As I said, I need some help as we go along. So Jake, you're going to be my first, my first person to help. So you're acquiring companies. Let's make you part of the finance group and the acquiring companies. You work at the finance group, you can, the acquiring company can be Pfizer, it can be GE, it can be Tesla. And I come to you with the target company, I'm the banker. I present you with the numbers. The numbers are as follows. The target company had revenues of 100 million in the most recent year, operating income of 20 million, and after tax operating income of 12 million. This target company is expected to generate this $12 million in after-tax operating income every year forever with no growth. And the cost of equity for this firm is 20%. Why it's a very risky sector. What's the value of this target company? Um, 60 million. 60 million. So tell me what you put in the numerator. You put it The 12 million after-tax. Okay, remind me again why, because usually we put cash flows, right? So why in this case, did you just put the after-tax operating income? Why didn't you think of CapEx and working capital and depreciation and all that reinvestment stuff? Um, because there's no growth. You have no growth, in which case, you can, so basically because you have no growth, you have no reinvestment, the after-tax operating income becomes a free cash flow to the firm. You discard back at 20%. It's forever, so it's a perpetuity. It's 60 million. Everybody agree with that? Because now, as a banker, I'm going to try to get you to pay more. Remember, that's my job as a banker is to get you to pay more than the 60 million. So, Rodrigo, I come to you with my first try. I say, look, you know, you work at this company and, and your cost of equity as the acquiring company is 10%. And I say, you know, what's the value of the target company to you? I mean, I, I show you the same financials I showed Jake. And I ask you, what's the value of the target company? What's your value? It shouldn't affect my, my cost of equity. shouldn't affect. And, and explain why, you know, because what was I trying to get you to do? You were trying to get me to use my own cost of capital. And use your own cost of equity, which would give you double the value, right? Yeah. So this is what happens in half of all acquisition valuations. So you're going to run into people who do this all the time. So I want you to tell me what you would tell them as to why it's inappropriate to use the acquiring company's cost of equity to value the target company. Because you should be comparing to the closest opportunity. So based yeah, on the based, risk based on of risk. the opportunity. Okay? Because people have this vision of discount rates being an opportunity cost. That's an incomplete statement. It's an opportunity cost for investments of equivalent risk. So first, already you can see why most M&As go off the, uh, off the rails right at this first step. If I use the acquiring company's cost of equity and capital, and remember that Kennecott example from way back in class, you're going to screw up your valuation. I don't care how carefully you estimate the cash flows. So it always 
has to be the target company's risk. Now, um, you're going to be my next experiment. So let, in this case, so let's, let's, so let's put the lesson here, which is when you value target companies, the risk of the equity comes from the risk of the target company. You cannot use the acquiring company's cost of equity because if you do that, you're going to end up finding every risky company looks cheap to you. You see why? Because I'm going to use it. And you're going to end up building a disaster of a company. And I'll give you examples of companies that have destroyed themselves because they violated this precept. AT&T did this to itself in the 1990s. But risky company after risky company using AT&T's low cost of equity and the whole thing blew up on them. G was able to pull off the charade for a lot longer, but eventually at G, the result of acquiring target companies and paying the acquiring company's cost of capital eventually caught up with G. So this is a rule that there are no exceptions. It's always about the target company. So now, now here's where it gets interesting. Let's assume that the acquiring company, so let's say that, that you're settled on the 20%, so I'm not gonna fight you on it, say, but, but you as the acquiring company have access to debt. Why? Because you've been around a long time, you've been conservative, and you can borrow money at a really low rate, let's say 4%. Let's say you plan to fund half of this acquisition at 4%, still the same target company. You now accepted the 20% cost of equity for the target company. With the fact that you're going to use 50% of the acquisition from debt and that it costs you only 4%, change how much you pay for the target company. Uh, yeah, so since I'm funding it more with debt, it, the amount I have to put up uh, will decrease. So I would be willing to pay lower. So give me the cost of capital. Then 50% is going to come from equity with a 20% cost of equity. 50% is going to come from debt with a 4% cost of debt. The weighted average cost of capital will now be 12%, right? Yep. Which given the 12 million in after tax operating income would give me a value of a hundred million. So I'm adding a $40 million premium. But let's take it a little deeper. Where's that extra four? Do you see where the 40 million comes from, right? The value that I got with the 20% cost of equity was 60 million. But if you take the same 12 million, use a 12% discount rate, which is what you'd get by taking a weighted average, the value I'm going to get is 100 million. So let's take it a little deeper. Where's the extra 40 million in value coming from? It's coming from the fact that you were able to borrow money at a really low rate, right? You as the acquiring company. You're paying this as a premium to the target company shareholders. There's a simple rule in acquisitions. Render unto the target company that which is theirs, but not a penny more. You see the danger of using the acquiring company? I know mechanically, the cost of capital looks like it's going to be much lower. And in fact, many M&A deals, you see this happening. Acquiring companies cost to debt, debt ratio put in. You're going to end up, but if you do that, you're giving the target company a premium for something that they had absolutely no role in creating. You did the hard work to get your low cost of debt. You did the hard work to get a debt capacity. Why would you want to give it away to the target company shareholders? In fact, I saw an acquisition a couple of a uh, couple of years ago, where the banker had valued the target company with the after-tax cost of debt of the acquiring company. You know how he justified it? He said, we're going to use all debt to fund the acquisition, which you can do, right? Big company buys a small company. You might be able to borrow the entire amount. And it costs us only 2% to borrow the money. You see the danger of doing this? You've essentially taken your excess debt capacity and you're subsidizing target company shareholders for something that they had no role in creating. So here's my second rule. When you value target company, don't even factor how much debt you use on this particular deal. It's got nothing to do with the target company. Don't bring in your cost of debt. It has nothing to do with the target company. This is something you earned as the acquiring company, and you don't want to pay it as a premium on an acquisition. Which brings me to control. I know whether you remember that card I held up at the start of the class, remember the 20% premium, you know, and we talked about the value control. I'll tell you where the 20% premium comes from, because you'll see this used by bankers all over the world. That premium comes from looking at historical deals. In other words, all M&A deals over the last 30 years. 
There's a data service called Mergerstat where you can get the information on every deal that's been done in the US going back 30 years. And here's what you would see as in, in the database. It'll give you the market price of the target company before the deal was announced. It'll give you the actual deal price at which the deal was consummated and it'll compute the premium. The 20%, roughly speaking, is the average premium that acquirers have paid for target companies over and above the pre-deal market price. It's called the control premium. So remember, I'm the banker. I have to get you to pay a premium. You refuse to use your cost of equity. That would have been easy. You refuse to use your cost of debt or the debt ratio. So now I say, look, you've got to pay at least a 20% premium. Why? Because everybody else does it. This is a control premium. Would you go along? Sebastian, is that uh, not the fact that, that, I, that acquirers have historically paid 20% over the market price? No, it, just, it would just mean I'd be making the same mistake as that. It makes no sense. First is, if they've been overpaying, then I'm going to overpay as well. Second, even if they've not made a mistake, is that 20% premium just for control? Could it be for synergy? Could it, I mean, all those other, so when they pay a premium, it's all in there, right? Part of it might be for control, but how do I know how much of that premium is for control? So that's why I, early on I said, let's not pay this 20, this 20 percent rule of thumb makes zero sense. Let's go back to what control actually means. And do you remember the essence of control is you plan to run the company differently. Take the target company. Right now, it has a 20% margin. If you remember, the revenues were 100 million. The pre-tax margin was 20%. They made a 20%, $20 million operating income. Let's say if you ran the company, and Rebecca, you can now run the company. Let's say if you ran the company, you'd run it much more efficiently. You'd cut costs. And by doing so, you'll improve the margin from 20% to 30%. In other words, the operating income will go from 20 million to 30 million. Rather control in the company if that if you can pull that off. Um, would that increase to the thirty percent? It basically it'll increase the it'll increase my after tax operating income from twelve million to eighteen million, holding all its constant with the same discount rate. My value will go from sixty to ninety million. There'll be a fifty percent increase in value because my operating income will increase by fifty percent. What's control worth of this company then? It's worth 50%. You're saying, this is good. Let me lose my rule of thumb. Not so fast, because what if the next company you target is perfectly managed and perfectly run already? You know what the value of control is going to be at that company, right? It's going to be zero. There's nothing you can change to the company. Sriram? Um, if you use like the same rule as last time, where while control does give you like, it will allow you to have a net present value of the company of $90 million. 90. Like you're sort of- You're doing the hard work. You're saying, why the heck should I pay the target company the 90 million? Is that what yeah. the question was? Absolutely. So, like, so what would you like to do? You'd like, you'd like to pay a little bit more than 60 million and keep some yeah. of that extra 30 million for yourself. Absolutely. So here's what you want to do. You want to value time. Whenever you do an acquisition valuation, Always value the target company standing alone first, the 60 million, put it in one pocket. Take the, the control value, put it in the second pocket. Remember which pocket, which number went into. So when you show up at the bargaining table, you start with the 60 million and say, look, you know, we're very careful buyers. We pay you 65 million. Act like you're doing the, the target company a favor. We'll pay 65. And of course, the CEO says, no, no, we're very, you know, we'll demand 75. And you know what? You'd be happy if you can buy the company at 75 because that way you split the value of control right, right down the middle. You get to keep half the value of control. They get to keep half. And that is a much fairer sharing of the increase in value that comes from control. So you're absolutely right. I wouldn't pay the entire 30 million. I'm willing to pay up to 30 million, but I want to pay as little of the 30 million away as a premium if I can. So here's the bottom line. There are lots of rules of thumb in acquisition. Most of them have absolutely no basis in reality. Those 20% control premiums, they're not even control premiums. They're just premiums. They could be for control. They could be for synergy. They could be for stupidity, which is we keep overpaying for companies. Guess where it shows up? It shows up as a historical premium. Ignore the rules of thumb. It's very difficult to do so. 
because it's intimidating. Bankers throw these rules at you and say, this is where it comes from. It's based on data. That makes it look like it's precise. How can you push back against it? The answer is very easy. Remember what they reflect. They reflect an average premium across all acquisitions. Now let's talk about synergy. Every deal that you see, almost, almost every deal, there's talk of synergy, right? You know what, what synergy implies, that two companies coming together are worth more than they would have as individual companies. That is the base of synergy, that they're able to do something as a combined company that they couldn't have done as standalone companies. So let's suppose I'm making an argument for synergy as a banker. I say, look, buy the target company. And if you buy the target company, your combined company is going to be much safer. Why? Because you're a steel company, they're a technology company. And because you tend to move in different directions, the combined company is going to be safer. That's actually true, right? We did this with option pricing last week. Combining two companies in different businesses will create a combined company that's more stable because you get earnings in different businesses. Will that also mean that the combined company will have a lower discount rate. I thought you know, discount rates reflected risk. And if it's true that creating this combined company makes you safer, shouldn't that also mean that the discount rate decreases when you do mergers and create a safer company? Angela, what do you think? No, Professor, I don't think so because they're in two separate businesses. And I think there's like something known as the conglomerate discount in which like um, you should look at like uh, like what is actually causing the risk and like there's no like synergies um, that you get from combining the company versus putting them in two separate ones. Okay, I think it's true there's a conglomerate discount, but even without the conglomerate discount, let's see why the, the argument breaks down. When we think about bringing two companies together and they get safer, guess what kinds of risks we're eliminating in the combined company? It's company specific risks. Think of how we compute cost of equity and capital. They're based on betas and risk you cannot diversify away. You cannot change that base risk by combining two companies. And the intuition is very simple. If your only explanation for why you did a merger is I bought a company in a different business and I paid a 20% premium, you know what I'm going to do as a stockholder? I'm going to say, I could have done that myself. It would cost me absolutely nothing. So when you hear about synergy, it very seldom shows up as a lower discount rate. Let me set that on the table. There are a couple of exceptions, but most of the time when you talk about synergy, it's not a discount rate effect. You cannot have a lower discount rate because of a merger. Most of the time, synergies show up in the cash flows. In one of two ways, they can show up as higher growth. You bring two companies together, maybe they can do things as a combined company that allows them to grow faster than they could have as individual companies. A developed market consumer product company buys an emerging market consumer product company. Growth could go up, why? Because a developed market company can now sell its products into this much bigger emerging market, whether it's India, China, that could create higher growth. Or it could come from economies of scale, cost savings. Two companies coming together are able to cut costs and improve their margins. Synergy, when it shows up, is much more likely to show up in the cash flows than it does in the discount rates. But as Sri Ram pointed out, be very careful. Even if that synergy exists, you don't want to pay the entire amount as a premium because if you do, what have you done? You've left the entire benefits of synergy with the target company shareholders. You got to keep at least some of this for your shareholders because that's the whole point of doing acquisitions is you want to make your shareholders better off. So we value synergy at 40 million. You don't want to pay the entire 40 million. You definitely don't want to pay more than 40 million, but you want to pay the entire 40 million. You want to pay 20 million or 25 because you are part of this process of creating synergy. Sriram? Uh, if the acquisition, like, or the merger shifts the market structure like uh, Sprint and T-Mobile. Is that the growth thing you were talking about? It's a growth story. Sprint and T-Mobile was a, was a growth story, more than a cost saving story that they, the, the, part of the problem Sprint and T-Mobile had is when they went after customers, they want, the customers wanted Verizon or AT&T because it was more national. They said, I get more national coverage with at and and Sprint and T-Mobile standing alone had good parts of the country and bad parts of the country, but they couldn't compete head to head against it. So I think 
part of it was driven by the need to be a national cell service that everybody could use. So the hope was by doing this, it's more likely that customers will pick us over AT&T and Verizon. Whether it's worked out or not, we can debate, but that was the reason, it was a growth reason. Any other questions? So let's talk about value synergy. And I'm gonna start by looking at the different forms synergy can take. When you look at a merger and there's synergy, the first question to ask is, what kind of synergy is this? Is this operating synergy or is this financial synergy? Let me explain the contrast. When you have operating synergy, it shows up as growth and cash flows, what we're talking about. And it's, a, I think, what I call the honest synergy and actually a higher value flow. And if you think about operating synergy, it can take two forms. It can take the form of economies of scale. <clears throat> you know, when this is a shop is when you have two steel companies coming together. And by coming together as a combined company, they're able to cut some costs, distribution, integration, whatever the costs are, which reduces their overall costs. Economies of scale are the easiest synergies to value because you cut costs, you have higher margins, higher margins translate to higher value. But the more exciting synergies, the synergy that people pay huge premiums for, are growth synergies. And growth synergies can take one of three forms. One is by combining two companies, you're able to earn higher returns on capital than you were as independent companies. Why? Because you've improved your competitive standing with the rest of the sector. So the first place can show up is at a higher return on capital. How does it help you? Higher return on capital translates to a higher growth rate. The second is maybe by combining two companies, you're able to find more projects, a higher reinvestment rate. How does that play out? It's a higher growth rate. Or maybe it's not even higher reinvestment or higher growth rate. It could be that you can maintain those excess returns for longer. How does that show up? It shows up as a longer growth period. See what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a something in my valuation that I can adjust to reflect the fact that you have synergies. So synergies can be operating synergies, growth or cost. I would love to tell you that most mergers are motivated by operating synergies, but I'd be lying. In my view, two thirds of mergers, when there is synergy, the synergy is financial synergy. You're saying, what is financial synergy? Let me take its most common form. It's tax savings. It's, I describe this as a synergy that should never be talked about. You know what I mean by never be talked about? If you're doing a merger and it's motivated primarily by your desire to pay less in taxes, for God's sakes, don't talk about it. You know why? What's the IRS rule on tax motivated transactions in general? If your transaction is primarily motivated by taxes, the IRS reserves the right to challenge you on that transaction because it's viewed as not legal. So they'll come after you. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In 2014, Pfizer, that time a New York-based company, US company, decided to do an inversion. We set the table. In 2014, the US tax laws were among the most dysfunctional in the world. The US had one of the highest marginal corporate tax rates in the world at 40%. And it also had the system where it taxed US companies based on the US tax rate, even on their global income. So if you're a US company making income in Hong Kong with a 15% tax rate, you're required to pay the 15% to Hong Kong and then pay an extra 25% to get you to, so basically the extra 25% being the extra tax rate in the US, but only when you brought the money back to the US. So you know what US companies increasingly did? They left their cash outside the US, creating this phenomenon called trap cash. And Pfizer in 2014 was a classic multinational company with a lot of trap cash. And it said, look, you know, we want this to change. So we're planning to do an inversion. Anybody know what an inversion is and what Pfizer was planning to do in 2014 to get out of the US tax code? Tim, do you remember? Apart, do you remember what the what? In inversion, here's what Pfizer was planning to do. It was planning to buy an Irish company, an Irish pharmaceutical company. In a, and they're actually planning to merge with an Irish pharmaceutical company. And after you merge, you get to pick 
which company is going to be the surviving company. So you know what Pfizer's plan was? To merge with this Irish pharmaceutical company, much smaller than they were, but there's nothing legally that requires that the larger company be the surviving company. They were going to buy the Irish company and let it become the parent company. Overnight, you see what that does, right? It takes a US company and it makes it an Irish company. What do I gain by being an Irish company? I no longer have this 40% tax rate and all of my income. It untraps my cash. In the 2014, there were about 50 US companies that inverted. But here's where Pfizer made its fatal mistake. Actually, Pfizer didn't make the fatal mistake. Its CEO made a fatal mistake. So they announced this merger. And then the Pfizer CEO gets on CNBC and he talks about the merger. So the CNBC host asks him, you know, why are you doing this merger? And I was watching that day. I don't know why I was watching CNBC. I must have been incredibly bored. But he says, and I couldn't believe my ears as he said this. He said, we're doing this merger because we want to pay less in taxes. My reaction was, what are you thinking? What do you think is going to happen after this interview goes out? And what you could predict was going to happen, happened right after the interview. He finishes the interview. And I remember four senators getting up in front of a middle, middle of a Senate session saying, we cannot allow this atrocity to continue of US companies in birding. The IRS woke up and said, we're going to scrutinize this deal to the nth degree. And I, Pfizer actually had to end up pulling out of the inversion because they made it all about taxes. He said, what choice do they have? You know what the CEO should have talked about? And CNBC asked him, why are you doing the deal? I thought that's strategic. Well, there were strategic considerations. Nobody's any idea what that means anyway. Talk about growth synergies, talk about economy, talk about everything but taxes. In fact, my advice to you is if you're ever doing a deal motivated by taxes, talk about everything under the sun except for taxes. But it's true though, taxes can be a big value creator, at least for the acquiring companies and deals. Why? Because if you're a money-making company buying a money-losing company, you could potentially save on taxes, right? Those losses offset your profits. If you're a company that's allowed to write up the book value of your assets after an acquisition, and you're often allowed to do that, you get more depreciation. Tax benefits are a big factor in many, in many mergers as a synergy. That's the first financial synergy. Here's the second one. You have two companies that by themselves can't borrow money. It's not because they don't want to, they can't. They're small, risky companies. Let's say the debt ratio is at 10%. They'd like to borrow more, but banks won't lend to them and they're too risky. Let's say these two companies combine to become a larger, more stable company. It's entirely plausible, right? That larger, more stable company could borrow more. Let's say it can borrow 20%. Overnight, you've created a tax benefit by being able to borrow more money. It's another variation of the tax benefit argument, but you could have added debt capacity be the second financial synergy. It's likely when you have small, risky companies merge with each other. There's a third scenario, and this is the only scenario where diversification might be an explanation for why you do a merger. I said for public companies, it makes no sense. Why? Because your investors can do it themselves. But let's say you're the owner of a private business. You've got an entire wealth tied up in this business. Remember we talked about this in the context of private company valuation. If you're an undiversified owner, what's the challenge you face? You're not diversified. You've got to use this total beta. Total beta reflects not just how much risk there is in the company, but all of the rest of the risk. Why? Because you're not diversified. And you see why, if you're the owner of a small private company, going out and acquiring another private company that is in a different sector can help you. Because by doing that, what are you doing? You're still a private company. You're still undiversified, but you've created a combined company that moves more with the market. You take a look at almost every family group in Asia and Latin America that goes back a century. I know in India, for instance, there are a lot of family groups that go back a century, the Tatas, the Birlas, not the Ambanis, but basically. And if you look at what those old family groups, what businesses those old family groups are in, they're in everything. They're in chemicals, they're in steel. You know why? Because as long as they were privately owned family group companies, they invest in every conceivable, they were creating an equivalent of a mutual fund by going out and buying companies in different businesses. It actually brings your total beta down because you become more diversified, more correlated with the market. 
So what's the first step in valuing synergy? You've got to be specific. Tell me what form the synergy will take. And I'm going to try to value the synergy. And it's a three-step process. The first step in valuing synergy is you have to value the acquiring company and the target company as standalone companies. You cannot value synergy by just valuing the target company. It's impossible to do. You've got to value the target company and the acquiring company as standalone companies. Second step, just add those two values together. Value is additive. You're allowed to do that. And step two, what you're now getting is the value of the combined company with no synergy. In step three, value the combined company with all your synergies built in, higher growth, lower cost, lower discount rate, bring in everything but the kitchen sink, value the combined company. And if you're right, what you get in step three as a value for the combined company would be greater than what you got in step two by adding up the two values. That difference is the value of synergy between step three and step two. You wanna try this? Let's take an example. About 20 years ago, in one of the biggest mergers of that time, the largest consumer product company in the world, Procter & Gamble, bought the sixth largest consumer product company in the world, Gillette. Talk of synergy filled the air. And I wanted to try to value synergy in the deal. So remember, the first step in the process is I valued Procter & Gamble standing alone, P&G, and Gillette standing alone. I got values of $221 billion for Procter & Gamble, $60 billion for Gillette. If I stop right there and added the two numbers up, I get 281 billion as the value of my combined company. So this merger had no synergy associated with it. The combined company would be worth 281 billion. But I did a best case valuation of synergy. In a minute, you're going to see why best case. I listened to what managers told me they would be able to do after the merger. They talked about cutting expenses by 250 million, economies of scale. And I believe them. And not only did I believe them, I assumed they could do it overnight. In other words, they would do the merger and overnight the cost would drop by 250 million. That's pretty optimistic because many companies don't deliver on the 250 million or it takes three years. I'm assuming they deliver and it happens overnight. What's that going to do? It's going to push up my margins. You cut costs by 250 million, leave revenues where they are. The margins go up because of that cost being cut. So higher operating income. They did also talk about slightly higher growth as a combined company. Procter & Gamble felt that Gillette hadn't fully exploited their benefits. So basically they assumed a growth, not hugely higher, but about 1% higher. So I built in the lower cost and the higher growth and I revalued the combined company. And I got a value of 298.4 billion. There's this canard in finance that in finance, we don't believe that synergy is value. That's not true. I'm attaching a $17.2 billion value. That's the difference between these two numbers as the value of synergy. But I'll give you the most depressing number in this whole deal. You know how much Procter & Gamble paid as a premium for Gillette? $25 billion. If you're a shareholder in Gillette, assuming even the best, I'm sorry, fair share, shareholder in Procter & Gamble, assuming even that you were as optimistic as I was, by paying 25 billion, what has Procter & Gamble done to you as a company? Bridget, if I pay 25 billion, my synergy is worth 17 billion. Overnight, what have I done to you as shareholders in the company? Destroyed like $8 billion of value. Destroyed $8 billion in value. And that's with the best case valuation of synergy. And the reason I keep using the word best case is we know that in most deals, when companies announce they're going to cut 250 million in costs, you know what they actually end up doing? Cutting 200 million or 150 million. They underperform. And even when they deliver, it takes two years, three years, four years for cost cuts to actually show up. In fact, practically, if you have a value of 17.2 billion for synergy, and let's say I told you to take three years for these cost cuts to show up. Louis, I'll come back to your question, but tell me if I had to wait three years to get the synergy, how would I adjust the value of synergy for the fact that I have to wait? What would I have to do? You would have to, so if the synergies weren't immediate, it would affect like the growth rate of the next year and the margins of, of next year, right? But, but a shortcut would be I could take the 17.2 billion and discount it back three years, right? Because if it would wait three years, that's the effect, the present value effect. You know what I discounted back at? 
I discounted back at the cost of capital for the combined company. Why? Because synergies accrue to the combined company. If I have a 9% cost of capital, 17 billion, discounted back three years gives me 15 billion. You pay 25 billion, you just overpaid by 10 billion. So let me start with Nick and then I'll come back to Louis. Nick? Yeah, Professor, uh, it's a quick question. Like when you did this, recalculated the cost of equity and the beta, I, I guess you weighted by the revenues, right? You weighted by, beta is always weighted by value. So basically I'd have to weight based on the values of the two companies. Remember the rule of beta, beta is always value weighted numbers. If you don't want those values, you want to use revenues, it could be a shortcut, but it's always a shortcut. Yeah, but the, my question is like, how, how can Gillette be, have a, like less beta when it's, let's say a less diversified company than PNG? I don't get that. No, no, wait, what does beta have to do with diversification? The beta is what's left over after you diversify, right? So I could be a diversified company with a beta of 1.5. And I can be an undiversified company with a beta of 0.4. If I'm a coal mining company, I'm completely undiversified. I'm just in coal mining. My beta is going to reflect just the market risk in the coal mining business. So what I do as a company, and this is what went back to why you cannot lower your cost of capital by going out and doing acquisitions, is I'm already focusing only on the risk you cannot diversify away. So whatever you do as a company can't affect that. So that's why the diversification of a company is going to have very little to do with what you observe as a beta for the company. I see. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Louis? So today, the values that you that you calculated here, did uh, P&G pay a premium over the value that you assigned it? You calculated it's very close. The market cap was about 60 billion. So I actually found that the pre, but your the premium is actually on the market price. And you're actually raising an interesting point. If the stock had been overvalued to begin with, and you pay a 20, 25 billion is a premium on top of that, it's a premium on top of a premium. And this is one of the problems with publicly traded companies, right? You pay a premium on top of the market price. And before you know it, you might be paying a 35 billion premium, billion dollar premium in intrinsic value. But the premium was actually on uh, that I computed was actually on a market price, but the market price was pretty close to the 59.9 billion. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Let's take a second example. Remember, I said that sometimes deals are motivated by taxes. Let, let me strip down a deal to its basics. So let's say you take Best Buy. It's the last, last electronics brick and mortar retail company standing, right? Everybody else has kind of faded away. And they're thinking about buying this company called Zenith. Most of you are too young to recognize that name, but Zenith at one time had one of the great brand names in the TV business. People used to actually walk and say, I want a Zenith TV. That was in like the 1960s or 70s. What's left of the company? Absolutely nothing. In fact, there's no business left. Nobody cares about its brand name. So you're saying, why would I buy Zenith? It has one very big asset. You know what its biggest asset is? It's been losing a lot of money for a long time. But that is your only remaining asset. You're in, you've really hit hard times, but they have an accumulated net operating loss of $2 billion. So I want to make this very clear. You're buying Zenith with open eyes. You're not buying it to bring it back to life. You're buying it because it has a $2 billion NOL. So here's my first question. If your tax rate is 36%, your best buy, your tax rate is 36%. What is the synergy value of buying this $2 billion NOL? Parth, can you help me out here? What's, what's, what's going to be the value of synergy? I'm not sure because your growth rate seems unchanged, uh, but your operating income slash losses for the year will drop from 500 million to negative 1.5. No, no, uh, don't even look at the second part. Let's say you have 2 billion in operating. If you had 2 billion in operating income, sure. what's your tax? What would you say? Oh, what's my tax uh, loss carry for? The value of that it, is- So basically 36% of 2 billion, which would be 720 million, right? Yes. If I only have half a billion in taxable income, clearly I can't claim the entire benefit. I might have to take 180 million year one, 180 million year two. So the growth, so the growth is kind of irrelevant, right? The, the only thing you're getting is an NOL, 
which means your cash flows are going to be the tax savings you get from the annual, whether you get it immediately or spread out over time is the only question you face. So let's say it's four years, 180 million a year. So what discount rate would I apply on that? Brian, you have any ideas on what I should discount that 180 million a year at to get the value of the tax savings today? Did I use cost of equity, cost of capital, Best Buy, Zenith, all these different choices. Which of those discount rates would I apply? Um, Zenith, since that's the company being acquired technically in this case. Right, and, but what are you acquiring when you acquire Zenith? You're getting a $2 billion NOL, which you know, it's a known. What's, what's the unknown? What's going to drive whether you get these tax savings or not? Not too sure. It's best by taxable income, right? Zenith is not even in the picture. When you think about the risk here is if I as Best Buy don't have the taxable income, I will not be able to claim the tax benefit. In other words, this is the case, which is an exception to that rule we said about target company discount rates. Here, the discount rate to value the synergy will be Best Buy's cost of equity. Why? Because my worry is about whether I'll have enough taxable income. Taxable income is equity income after interest expenses. So I'll be using Best Buy's cost of equity discount $180 million every year for the next four years. I'll give you a very simple rule because this is something you're going to run into repeatedly in finance. You'll have a set of cash flows and somebody said, well, what discount rate should we use in the cash flows? Always go back and ask the question, where is my risk coming from? What am I uncertain about? Because if you answer that question, you in a sense also answered what kind of discount rate you should be using. Here, the uncertainty is entirely around Best Buy's taxable income, which means the discount rate has to be the cost of equity for Best Buy. So here's the bottom line when it comes to synergy. Don't pay for synergy just because it sounds good. If you're doing an acquisition motivated by synergy, you have to give me specifics. You have to tell me what form the synergy will take. And I'm going to try my best to value the synergy. Because if I don't do that, it just becomes a plug variable. You know what I mean by plug variable? It's whatever the word you use to explain away the difference between what you pay and what the price of a company is. If you're going to pay for synergy, you have to value the synergy. Nick, you have another question? Is your hand up from before? Okay. So at this stage, I'm running into a brick wall with you because I tried to get you to use your cost of equity, you refused. I tried to use the cost of debt that you had, but you said, no way. I tried to make you pay a 20% premium for control and you said, not in this case. I'm trying to get you to value synergy, but you don't see any. So I'm the banker, I would really want this deal to go through. So I switch, I switch my pitch, I say, look, why are we using this DCF stuff? It's academic. Let me price the company for you. And here's how I price the company. I find what I call transaction multiples. You know how you're doing the pricing for your company, you're bringing in companies in your sector. I do something weird. I go look at other acquisitions that have happened in your sector in the last three years. And I come back and say, over the last three years, acquirers in your sector have paid five times EBIT. You remember the EBIT in your target company was 20 million, five times 20 million is 100 million. And I say, yeah, that's what you need to pay. First, do you think this is a good idea if you're uh, acquiring company to be pricing a target company? Bridget, what do you think? Do you think you know, pricing a target company is a good idea if you're, if you're an acquiring company? Uh, probably not because that, that um, price will bake in the pertinent synergies to that deal, which might not be applicable to your deal. That, that's possible. But, but also, when you price companies, traders do it all the time. What's your end game? What do you, how do you make money on the pricing game? You buy at a low price, you sell at a higher price. You hope to sell it to somebody else, right? So when traders use pricing, they use multiples. At least they can argue, look, my time horizon is not forever. I'm going to have for six months. I'm... When you acquire a company in an acquisition, you know what your plans are, right? You want to hold the company. You want to collect the cash flows. The very nature of the acquisition process means that you are a better candidate for intrinsic valuation than pricing. But you know, 90% of acquisitions, 
are based on pricing. And you can see exactly why. Who's doing all the number crunching in an acquisition? It's definitely not the CFO of the acquiring company. It's not the CEO of the target company. It is the bankers involved in the deal. Now, do you see why pricing gets used? What's the end game for a banker? Get the deal done. Pricing is exactly right, given that objective. I don't blame bankers for using five times EBIT, but I'll clearly blame you if you're the CFO of the acquiring company and you take that pricing as a given, because this is not your game. You should be trying to do an inference evaluation. And even if the banker tries to give you this, you know, and often bankers will do this if they get pushed as, oh, you're a DCF guy. What if I use the pricing just on the terminal value? You know what I mean by using the terminal value. I'll do your cash flows in the next 10 years, but then I'll use five times EBIT on your 10s EBIT. It, after this class, hopefully you will not accept that kind of crap because pushing the pricing off into a future year doesn't make it any less of a pricing. It just makes it a forward pricing. In my view, pricing has no place in acquisitions if you're an acquiring company CFO. And it's your job to make sure that valuations get done because you're buying a set of cash flows and you got to make sure you're paying enough. And there's one word I would want you to watch out for because bankers will use this to push you into a deal. So what a creative. I'll tell you this deal is a creative and in, in, in M&A, this is like a magic word. The minute you use the word accretive, people jump on and say, that must be a good deal. Does anybody know what the meaning of the word accretive is? What do, what do bankers mean when they say a deal will be accretive? I'll tell you the twin to this word. It's dilutive. Dilutive is bad, accretive is good. I think I've given you enough of a kind of clues. What do bankers mean when they say creative or dilutive? Um, what, what do they mean? Do they mean that the earnings per share will increase? That's so all it is. If your earnings per share will go up after a deal, it's accretive. And if your earnings per share will go down after a deal, it's dilutive. It's an extraordinarily stupid way to assess an M&A. And here's why. If you want your deal to be a creative, do you want to borrow money to do an acquisition and use shares to do an acquisition? Let's start simple. You want to borrow money, right? Because borrowing money, your share count doesn't change. If nothing else, any deal funded with debt is always going to be more accretive than a deal that's funded entirely with equity. It's one of the stupidest words I've seen used to justify deals, but it's amazing how much of banking is built around a creative and dilutive. So pricing is okay, but bad pricing is not. And not only does pricing not fit in M&A valuation because you're buying cash flows, but if you're basing it on transaction multiples, you have a bias sample. Do you see why? At least in, in in honest pricing, you're pulling up every company in your sector. You're looking at what everybody's paying, you're controlling for differences. But if you're looking at just acquisitions in your sector, you're already starting with a sample where you know people on average tend to pay too much. We know that by looking at past acquisitions. I think Sebastian pointed out, if you pay a premium and this is what everybody has paid, and if they're all overpaying, you're gonna overpay as well. So if your banker insists on doing pricing, at least push for an honest pricing. What does that mean? If you're buying a chemical company, look at all chemical companies, not at just the chemical companies that got acquired in the last three or four or five years. And exit multiples don't really change the game. It's still a pricing. So here's my bottom line. Don't fall for something because everybody does, does it. Because bankers are going to say, well, everybody uses pricing. Okay. But it's my money. It's my shareholders' money. Just because everybody else uses it doesn't make it right. And when you factor in that this is a pricing, you need to make sure at least it's a pricing that reflects the reality. And as I said, accretion and delusion is a complete non-signal of how good or bad a deal is. Because I can make a bad deal and make it an accretive deal by doing what? Using all debt on my deal. If I overpay for a company and use all debt, guess what? It is going to be accretive. If I take a good deal and use all shares, it might look dilutive. One doesn't lead to the other. In fact, McKinsey did a study where they broke down all M&A deals done over a period of like 10 years into accretive deals and dilutive deals. And then they tracked these deals to see which ones created more value for their shareholders. Guess what they found? 
Dilutive deals actually did better for their shareholders than accretive deals. I'll send you the link to the study because you want to keep this link. And the next time a banker shows up and uses the word accretive and dilutive, send him this link. Because it shows you how dangerous this fixation with per shares and dilutive and accretive has become. So at this stage, as a banker, I'm getting really frustrated with you. You're the finance guy in the company, and you said you're refusing to do what I tried to get you to do. Use your cost of equity, use a cost. Basically, you're, everything I throw at you, you're being resistant. But I'm a banker. I want the deal to go through. So I hit you with what I think is going to make you change your mind. I said, you're a good guy. But you're a middle person in the finance group. And I have to tell you, your CEO really, really, really wants this deal to go through. And you know what? We've got a couple of investment bankers lined up who will sign a fairness opinion for 100 million if you pay 100 million. So you know how I've sweetened the pitch here, right? Or at least I've made it more dangerous for you to keep opposing this deal. What am I saying? If you keep opposing this deal, I'm going to go above your head to your CEO and tell them you're being too resistant. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to get removed. Somebody else more compliant is going to be put in there. And the deal is going to go through. And he's also giving, and I'm also giving you protection. I'm saying, look, you know, if this deal goes through and you overpay, don't worry. Because I bought you protection against future lawsuits. That's what a fairness opinion is. It's basically protection against getting sued. I might not say it this directly, but I will find subtle ways of reminding you that people above you, people more powerful than you, have already decided that these, the, this deal is a good deal. And it's in your best interest then to come to terms with that and agree to something that will let the deal go through. Or I'll try a different pitch. I'll say, look, you know, I know you know you're, you're probably paying too much for the deal, but you have no choice. And here's why. If you don't do this, a competitor in this business is going to do it, and you're going to be falling even further behind. It's called defensive acquisitions. I'll give you an example. So about five years ago, Walmart bought this Indian online retailer called Flipkart for $21 billion. I called it the most expensive facelift in history when they did it. And the reason it made absolutely no sense is Flipkart was a money losing business without even a pathway to making money. It was a horrifically structured business, a horrible business. So why would Walmart pay 21 billion for a bad company? You know why Walmart paid 21 billion? Because there were rumors that Amazon was interested in buying Flipkart. And I think these rumors were planted by Amazon. And Walmart said, we can't let Amazon do it. So we're going to go out and overpay as much as we can to buy the company. That's what a defensive acquisition is. You overpay, you know you're overpaying, but you're afraid that if you don't do it, you're compared as well. You know how many times I've run into CFOs and said, this deal makes no sense. Why are you doing it? Because we don't do it. One of our competitors will do it, to which my response is, let them do it. Because when they do a bad deal, what are they doing to their shareholders? They're shooting themselves in the foot. You know what? It's easier to win a race against somebody who shot themselves in the foot. Why do you shoot? I mean, it's almost like you say, look, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. I'll shoot myself in the foot instead. Does this make any sense to you? I mean, that's what a defensive acquisition is. So here's the bottom line. In deals, your biggest enemy is not the numbers. It's not the mechanics. Nothing I've said today is, you know, it, it requires any kind of deep thought. This is not finance 701, it's finance 101. The problem here is you got egos involved. And many of these egos are up the most, uh, the problem with acquisitions in general, it's top down. No acquisition is ever motivated by a bunch of middle managers getting together and saying, oh, let's do an acquisition. Acquisitions almost always start at the top. A CEO wakes up and says, I want to do an acquisition. The whole process spins out of control. And once the deal takes on traction, it's almost impossible to stop it. Too many people are vested in it. Too many egos are involved. And nobody wants 
to lose, especially because they're playing with other people's money. That's really the, the big factor. You're playing with other people's money. You don't want to lose. Essentially, that's exactly what's going to happen. So I'll give you an example of how bad deals take form and then how they fall apart. You're all familiar with HP, right? This corporate governance nightmare that's been wandering around as a publicly traded company for the last 20 years. So about 12, 13 years ago, HP decides to do an acquisition of a UK-based software company called Autonomy. And they did it because they thought there was synergy. So they paid about $11.1 billion for Autonomy, which was almost 100% premium over the market price. The market price was $5.9 billion. They almost doubled that, $11.1 billion. And even people who are used to the M&A process were shocked. This sounds like a huge premium. Why are you paying this? And HP spent a lot, lot of the time and energy trying to justify why they paid the premium. And here's how they ended up with $11.1 billion. They started with a book value of equity of about $2.1 billion as a pre-deal book value. They brought in a bunch of accountants to do what's called fair value reassessment, which often is an reappraisal of the book value. The accountants magically managed to double the book value to 4.6 billion. They basically wrote up assets and the market was already at 5.9 billion. And then they said the extra 5.2 billion is for synergy. And they left it at that fuzzy word, synergy. And as I said, there was a lot of pushback. People thought they'd paid too much. And at that time, HP was, was CEO was a guy called Leo Apotheker. Now this guy should never have been allowed to become the CEO of any company. He shouldn't have been allowed to become a janitor of a company. But he became CEO because the previous CEO guy, guy called Mark Hurd had to resign because of some kind of sex scandal. Now you can see why I call this a corporate governance nightmare. Bad CEO leaves because of a sex scandal. They replace him with an even worse CEO has no idea what he's doing. So right after this deal is done, Leo is in front of a group of equity research analysts in New York and they grill him about why HP paid so much. So I'm gonna use exactly the words that Leo used. So I, I'm not accused of putting words in his mouth. So here's what Mr. Apotheker is telling the conference of analysts about why HP paid what they did. He said, we have a pretty rigorous process inside HP that we follow for all our acquisitions. I'm already impressed, pretty rigorous process, okay? I'm waiting, which is a D.C.F based model. I would have loved for somebody in the audience to put up their hand and say, Mr. Apotheka, could you expand on the D.C.F? What do they stand for? My guess is you wouldn't have known, but it's a D.C.F, okay. A reference to discounted cash flow valuation, a standard valuation methodology. This is the journalist throwing in their own two cents saying, I know what DCF is, let me expand it out for you. And we tried to take a very conservative view. I'm feeling much better about this deal. They've done a D.C.F and they've been very conservative along the way. And this is when Mr. Apotheker should have stopped because he kept going. He said, just to make sure everybody understands, autonomy will be on day one, accretive to HP. The magic word has shown up, it's accretive. Now I'm in complete surrender. This must be a great deal, it's accretive. Just take it from us. We did that analysis at great length, in great detail, and we feel we paid a very fair price to be a, give a great return to our shareholders. Managed to slip in three greats into two sentences. He should have just stopped after the, in fact, he shouldn't have talked at all. Because you know what happened a year later? HP admitted to one of the most monumental acquisition mistakes of all time. I've never seen an acquisition be un, you know, unraveled this quickly. They actually had to write off almost $8.8 .8 billion as a mistake. It's a pretty big mistake, right? They said the entire thing was because of accounting irregularities at autonomy. That's a nice convenient way to say it's not our fault. The accountants lied to us. So I decided to assign blame because you had an $8.8 .8 billion mistake. Somebody has to pay the price. Somebody has to be responsible. So I started allocating the $8.8 .8 billion. Some of it I said, hey, that apotheker clearly made a mistake. He and his, and his bankers should really be held responsible for about $4.5 because they overestimated synergy. They clearly the 
about um, two and a half billion. I said, okay, I'm willing to give it to the accountants at Autonomy who played fast and loose with the rules. So that's Deloitte. Then I said, another 1.9 billion came after you took over the firm. This has to be HP's post deal management. And I said, if this were a just world, here's what I'd expect to see happen. Mr. Apotheker should return all the bonuses he received as a CEO to capture the 4.5 billion. The bankers involved in the original deal should be returning all their deal fees instantaneously. Deloitte should be returning all the accounting and auditing fees they collected from autonomy for doing the accounting. But guess how many people actually kicked in to cover this loss, not one. And this is what I mean about no account. You have an $8.8 .8 billion mistake and nobody is being held accountable. Why when a deal goes bad, don't we go back to the original deal makers and say, somebody's got to bear the price here of screwing up. Because if you don't have a price, guess what you're going to do? You're going to overestimate everything, get the deal through and say, it's not my fault. So this stage, if you're thinking about going to M&A, it's been a pretty depressing session. Let me leave you with at least a glimmer of hope. So let's say you become, you go to work for a company that says, look, it wants to grow through acquisitions. After this class, you're saying, are you crazy? But let's see where your odds are better as an acquirer in terms of creating value. So with each one, I'm going to ask you to pick. So you're an acquiring company, you're intent on growing through acquisitions. I'm gonna offer you choices and you tell me which one you would pick to, to improve your odds. So Parth, let me start with you. Now, as an acquiring company, would you rather be a sole bidder or be in a bidding war? A uh, sole bidder. Okay, that was easy, right? So, and I'll back this up with actual numbers. So, like, so if, there's, if another person shows up, you're gonna drop out right away, sole bidder. Angela? Would you rather go after public targets or private targets? Public companies or privately owned companies, which gives you a better chance of winning? Did a private target. And tell me why. Um, just because uh, it's like not as liquid, so. And also with a public company, what do you have to do? You have to pay market price plus, right? The market already reflects all kinds of crazy things. You've got to pay a premium on it. Third, and Jake, this is a tougher one. Would you rather pay with cash or pay with stock? I'm thinking cash. Does, would it depend on something? Would it depend on whether you thought your shares were overvalued, undervalued, that factor in? As an acquiring company, if you had a lot of overvalued shares, might you be tempted to pay with shares because it's like cheap currency? Yeah, that's true. If it's overvalued, I'd rather use stock. If it's undervalued, I'd rather use cash. It's trickier, right? Because cash obviously is in cash or shares. When you pay with your own shares, of course, we have overvalued shares, like paying with like diluted currency. Sriram, small targets or big targets? Would you rather go after you know, target companies that are much smaller than you are or target companies about your size or big companies? Mergers of equals or mergers of unequals? Uh, I would probably prefer smaller targets. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Now, mergers of equals have a history of crashing and burning, cultural problems, things difficult to integrate. And finally, Tim, cost synergies or growth synergies? Where do you think the potential? Well, I think the cost synergy is easier, but then if you can get the growth synergy, that would be That's more- That's actually a good point. Your bigger upside on growth synergies, right? You get a much more, much greater upside, but cost synergies are more tangible. It's easier to deliver on. It's more likely that you're- uh -huh. so, so let's see what the evidence actually looks like. Let's start with one of my favorite studies of all time. This study looked at what happens when you have a bidding war for a target company. And in a bidding war, of course, there's a winner of the bidding war and there's a loser of the bidding war. So don't even look at the, at the bottom yet because this is a graph. So day zero is what happens. That's the day that the winner is anointed. And what you see in the following periods is what happens to the winners and losers of bidding wars. So obviously one of these groups ends up post, post acquisition becoming you know money losing company and one of these becomes you know the so which one of these do you think is the winning company the company that loses stock price or gains stock price 
you know what? This is, these are the winning companies. In the months after you won the bidding war and you got anointed as a winner, guess what happens? Your stock price drops 30%. The losing companies actually see their stock prices go up. You're saying, that makes no sense. It makes complete sense because how do you win a bidding war? By paying more than the other guy. You heard of the winner's curse in auctions? You know the winner's curse is? When you win an auction, you always should have mixed feelings about winning. Part of you is happy, you won. But think of what, why you won. You won because everybody else in the room thought you were paying too much. And in economics, there's actually well-established evidence that there's a winner's curse in auctions, that people tend to overpay if they're the winners in auctions. There's your winner's curse. You know what my lesson from this is? If I'm an acquirer and there is another person who shows up, I'm dropping out. I'm not even getting to a bidding war because there's no good outcome for me at the end. Now let's look at what happens in terms of target companies. First, in this graph, I look at target companies based on how big they are relative to me. Because remember, when we talk about small and big, it's relative. When a $50 billion company buys a $10 billion company, that's a pretty big acquisition. But when Apple, which is a $2 trillion company, buys a $10 billion company, it's like penny change. So what the study looked at was how big the target company was relative to the acquiring company and classified based on, is it less than 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 15, et cetera. And here's what it found. Let's focus on across all mergers, the smaller the target company, so the smallest target companies, you get an increase in value, which is a blue, that's the only group of acquisitions where you see a potential increase in value. As the, the target company gets bigger and bigger relative to you, the returns get worse and worse. You're far better off targeting small companies rather than big companies. Saying, what about cash versus stock? Here it gets a little tricky. With really small deals, it turns out that stock-based acquisitions do better. So when you're a big company buying a really small company, paying with shares gives you a much better outcome. But when you do big deals, it turns out that paying with shares actually gives you worse outcomes. It sounds weird. You think, why would it matter how big the deal is? Imagine being the shareholder in a target company, and I'm the acquiring company. And these are two big companies trying to merge. And I offer shares in my company to you. Does it signal something to you about what I think about my own shares? What is the fact that I'm using shares in this deal tell you about what I think about my own shares? It must mean that I think they're a little overvalued, right? And because you know that I'm doing that, what are you going to do? You're going to raise the premium you demand. You know that the premium paid on share-based acquisitions is about 5% higher than the premium paid on cash-based acquisitions because target company shareholders are not stupid. It's game theory playing out. And when you look at different kinds of targets, and look, I've looked at, for instance, public companies, the blue, private targets, and subsidiaries. Let's take private, public versus private, no contest. If I were given a choice, I'd much rather target a private target rather than a public target because I don't have to my market price first. But you know what? Even, what's even better than buying private companies is subsidiaries of public companies. You think, why, would, why is that better? Because you know, when public companies get rid of divisions, it's because when they get desperate. I remember Tata Motors buying Jaguar Land Rover in 2009. They bought Jaguar Land Rover from Ford. And you know why Ford was desperate to get rid of Jaguar Land Rover in 2009? Because the crisis just happened. They wanted to get rid of the division. They would have accepted any price. And Tata Motors took full advantage of it. And finally, if you look at growth versus cost synergies, this is from a McKinsey study that looked at the number of companies that promise things and how many actually deliver. So let's take companies that promise revenue growth synergies. About 17 out of the 77 deliver more than 100%, which means what? That 60 out of the 77 actually deliver less than they promise. So in revenue growth, you see a lot of companies underperforming. But if you look at cost synergies, there were 92 companies, 36 delivered more than their promised, and at least 61 delivered very close to what they promised. And this goes back to Tim's point, cost synergies are simpler, they're easier to deliver. They might have less upside, but look at the history of companies, you see far more likely that you, you will get that delivered. 
So if you're a company that wants to grow through acquisitions and you came to me for advice, first, I'm going to try to talk you out of the strategy. I said, look, you know, it's better to grow organically than to grow through acquisitions. But if you say, look, I'm absolutely focused on growing through acquisitions and I believe in synergies, I'm going to say focus on synergies that you can deliver more than synergies that are just whole. Synergies that you can plan for. And uh, because if you don't plan, it's not going to happen on its own. So you've got to plan for synergy. And they're much more likely to show up when somebody's held responsible for delivering that synergy. My advice to companies is if there's somebody who's really pushing for an acquisition because there's synergy, here's what you should do. Say, look, okay, we'll do the acquisition, but we're also going to make you head of the division to deliver the synergies. And guess what? If you don't deliver what you promised on paper here, you're fired. Be amazing how quickly people bring down their forecast of future synergy if they actually have to deliver it. And for God's sakes, don't get into a bidding war. There's no way you can win that bidding war. So here's the bottom line on acquisitions. To be successful with acquisitions, you need to be disciplined. Discipline means you got to have a game plan, you got to stick with it, and you have to know when the game stopped working for you. So if your quarterback is, you know, you know throwing, you know, it used to be, again, I remember, and no, no, I'm a Giants fan, and Eli Manning, by the time you got to the last three years, every time he, he said, please, please don't throw the ball. Just run the ball. Nothing good is going to happen here. The same thing applies with acquisitions. You might have been a great acquisitive company. Cisco is one of the great you know, companies of, in terms of acquisitions in the 1990s, completely destroyed itself the next decade. Even though the CEO was still the same guy, the strategy was the same, the game had changed under them. You have to know when to stop with acquisitions. And that's really difficult to do. That's why when I look at companies and I invest in companies, one of the things that triggers always a second look at a company is if that company does a big acquisition. I mean, I own Microsoft. It's in my portfolio. I own Facebook. But nothing is permanent. If Microsoft announced a $300 billion acquisition tomorrow, I'm going to have to take a really careful look on whether Microsoft still belongs in my portfolio. Big acquisitions are how great companies become average companies. You look at the history of great work. One big bad deal can take a company and make it go from being a really good company to a company that's not just average, but below average. Nick? Yes, Professor. Uh, my question is like, given this story you kind of told, like, taught us today about acquisition, like, what, what would you, the story you would tell about Valiant, like, and how they grew through acquisition? Well, Valiant is partly through acquisition, but you know what they acquired, right? Pharmaceutical companies with drugs treating rare diseases that they felt were being underpriced. Valiant's problem is not an acquisition problem. It's that they had a fundamental moral problem with their business model that, you know what, what the moral problem is. If I told you that the way I make money is I take a drug that only 5,000 people use, but they need it to live, but I quadruple the price. I'm going to have a really tough time pushing this business model out there and people saying, oh, that's a great business model. Valiant was able to do that when they were smaller. As they got bigger, they had a problem. So it's one of those few examples we can point to where you say, look, you know, don't be bad as a company. Don't push a business model that is fundamentally at its core difficult to defend and push it to a point where it blows up on you. So Valid was actually very good at acquisition. That wasn't their problem. They actually were very good at following through and raising price. That wasn't their problem. It's once people realized what their business model was, it became very difficult for Valid to justify that business model morally and ethically. And that's when the company blew up. Yes, that's make, that makes sense. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Any other questions? So I will see you on Wednesday. In fact, I'll send you a link to this SAB Miller InBev merger from five years ago because it'll take you at least through a template of what to do in an M&A deal using many of the tools we've already talked about in valuation. So I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care. Uh, professor? Yes. Actually, for the regression, I've never done regression before. So um, do you have any like good source that I can 
do and like learn how to do regression quickly. What's it, two weeks ago, the evaluation tools of the week? To go back and look at the evaluation. Remember the one I post every Friday? Okay. About two weeks ago, I did this on, I, and I don't know what the sector was, banks or steel, but I take you through the process oh, of how okay. you run a regression, what you need to do. Okay, I'll but, do but, but the thing is, uh, are you running it within Excel? Or are you planning to bring in Minitab? Or because I know that at Stern, you have statistics package. What, what are you planning to use as your package? Yeah, I was, I was planning to do just Excel, but um, okay, I can, can definitely... Excel works, but Excel, mm -hmm. the one thing that is a little tricky is the independent variables have to be in contiguous columns. So if you want to use growth, risk, and payout, you have to make sure they're in columns next to each other. So you can't okay. pick, you know, three. So it's kind of a pain in the neck. Excel wasn't designed purely for statistics. So you can stay within right. Excel, but you got to play a little a few games to make it work. But Excel is enough tools okay. that you can use the multiple regression thing and the data analysis. Okay. Okay. And, back. And also quick thoughts on Teladoc. Like I think the PEG is like the best multiple for me to use. Um, do you agree with that? Well, I think peg ratios come as a, as a flawed multiple because of the linear, because the assumptions you made about how growth and PE work. So peg ratios work. My guess is PE ratios will also work. But yeah, growth okay. as a different, because as long as you can control for difference in growth, which is what you do in a regression, you can get everything you need in a peg ratio through the regression. The reason people mm -hmm. use peg ratios is they're not using regression. They just run the peg ratio, compare peg ratios. But do you take PE and mm -hmm. make growth an independent variable? You can get everything you mm -hmm. get in a peg ratio without many of the limitations of peg ratios. I see. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Okay. Um. Hi, Professor. Yeah, I'm valuing AIG, so like an insurance company. So I'm going to use the dividend discount model uh, that you have on your website. Yeah. Um. But the only thing with that, like you said, you in an, one of the previous emails, like in our write up, you wanted like a, a screenshot of like the summary output. Um, but the dividend discount model doesn't have like that summary does, page. Right? I mean, you have an earnings, so you can create your own. It's not, there are like four, okay. inputs, right? You got earnings. So basically create your own. There's nothing. So take my, my page, which I have and just create your own version of it. Cause all the story page does is when I ask you for growth rate and return and equity and payout ratios, there's an inherent story you're telling about AIG that drives mm -hmm. those inputs. So create a small story page. It'll be much more compact than mine because it was only three or four assumptions and the output will be earnings and dividends each year. And so it'll, it'll look very much like my page will be just simpler. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So professor, one more quick question regarding yep. that question. So for it, so more from a final paper, uh, um, do, I, do you want me to write down the story or just took a screenshot of the evaluation Excel sheet and then just put it in the final right written document. Well, you can do both, right? You can create an Excel sheet with a story embedded in it. That's what I do, the worksheet that's embedded into all my DCF. So try mm -hmm. to create a worksheet where you can show me the numbers and you can show mm -hmm. them the story on the same page rather than tell the story first and then put the numbers. It actually is more effective right. because I can tie a particular part of the story to why you use the revenue growth that you did or the margins oh, that you did. So no. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome.